If you were to ask someone what was the greatest comeback in the history of Ohio State football, they might say 2017 against Penn State or 2015 against Alabama, maybe even 1984 against Illinois, and those would all be great answers. But they would be wrong. Nineteen eighty nine was the second season that John Cooper coached the Ohio State Buckeyes, and the season got off to a bit of a rocky start. They dropped two games out of the first six, and as they entered their seventh game in Minnesota, it certainly looked like they were about to drop a third. But fate had other plans. I think we were probably favored going into that game. We were four and two, I think, going into that ball game. They probably felt like they had to play really good and when you coach Ohio State, Chris, the one thing you're going to do, you're going to get the other team's best effort, no, no matter who you're playing. And I'm sure they had our game circled, you know, in one of the big big games, and that was that would have been a great win for them at home against us. I knew one thing, our team wasn't going to quit. That coaching staff wanted to really get focused on the running game, and they they really wouldn't let us throw very much in the, the two or three games preceding Minnesota. It was quite frustrating for me because you know I knew we could throw the ball. We had a, we had a great receiving core. That that set the stage for for that game. Anything that could uh, go bad, what what pass against us in the first half? As I recall, I think we turned the ball over. They scored a couple of quick touchdowns and some cheap touchdowns. Our our defense gave up some big plays. It was Murphy's law in the first half. Uh, we really ran into a buzzball with Minnesota team that really came ready to play. I mean their energy was high. They were extremely physical, and we made mistakes, and we put the ball on the ground. I, I, I know that uh, I had a ball stripped for me, uh, you know, like a strip sack for a turnover in the first half. I also had a tip pass get intercepted. Uh, we muffed a punt, uh, and those are just the ones that I can remember. And like any good team does, you know, Minnesota capitalized. Every time we made a mistake, it seemed like they, they stuck in the end zone. They gave us their best shot. I mean, that was as physical of a game as I can remember. And, uh, and they came ready to play, and, and they weren't making mistakes. So we, you know, we kept shooting ourselves in the foot, and they kept capitalizing. And that's, you know, when you're a good team, that's what you do. Carlos Snow just run a kickoff back a long way. We were trailing 10 to nothing. We finally had something positive. And in first down, it's a running play, and you get stuffed. Second down, it's a running play, and you get stuffed. It's third and goal on the ninth, I'm out. And you get another running play. There's almost a mutiny in the huddle, like, you know, hey, let's just, let's go score. And I saw Jeff Graham one-on-one -on -one to the outside. So I, I changed the play, and everybody heard me except Jeff Davis, who was our left guard. They blitzed where he vacated. Jeff Graham's open. I mean, I could have thrown some left-handed. Ridiculous. And I get popped right in the middle back. The ball goes flying up in the air. The free safety's blitzing behind him and catches it on a dead run and takes it to, you know, to the house for a touchdown. So instead of 10 to 3 or 10 to 7 you get 17 to nothing and you just ignited a, a fire uh for minnesota on the opposite sideline that's the reason we were down at halftime we didn't take advantage of our field position we get the ball down on there in the field to score and turn the ball over and they'll, they'll get you beat i call that a cheap touchdown to the best score and we give them the score when you do that you're going to have the battle on your hands they had a chance to put us away they had us 31 to nothing it was almost surreal and I remember walking off the field like it's 31 to nothing, we got to punt again. They're going to score again. And on the punt, they had 12 guys in the field. And that was, I remember when that happened, I'm like, okay, you, you should not have done that. Because <laughs> you just, now it was just like, I finally hit the wall like, I have nothing to lose here. I'm going to go let it rip. And we got a pass interference penalty on a deep ball, gave us a little bit of momentum. So two penalties really gave us momentum. You know, we got down inside the five. It basically came down to a fourth down play. And we, we ran a toss sweep with Carlos Snow. And Carlos run the linebacker over. At that point, you're like, well, we got to go for two. So that was pretty easy. So it was 31 to 8 going to halftime. And that, uh, from a confidence standpoint, that was pretty significant to be able to have something positive happening going into halftime. That's why we won the game. We went in. At halftime, with all the momentum, I knew we were going to get the ball to start the second half. If they had held us and it had been 31 to half halftime, chances are we would have lost the game. 
I actually told our team at halftime, we're going to get the ball to start the second half. We're going to take it and go score and, you know, go win the game. We were very composed. We knew that offensively we could put a lot of points on the board. The only question was, did we have enough time? From a quarterback standpoint, the frustration for me was that I felt like I had the handcuffs on. Like, they wouldn't let me do what I could do. And now we're in a situation where they had no choice. They had to throw the ball. And that gave me freedom. And it allowed me to show what I could do without any constraints. And certainly the second half, you know, things were a little bit different. If anything, offensively, we threw the ball much more in the second half. We got into that game. I was pretty much noted, as, and Ohio State football was pretty much noted for running the ball. We made an effort to run it more in the first half and actually won the game by throwing it more in the second half. You know, the first drive was really important because we drove nearly the length of the field and we got a field goal out of it, which didn't seem like much. You know, it made it 31 to 11. It's like, eh, no big deal, you know, for, for Minnesota. Another touchdown, I threw a vertical to Carlos Snow, which I had never thrown. Dropped back pass on first down inside the 20-yard line, and they jumped Jeff Graham and Bobby Olive, and, and Carlos was running down the middle wide open, and I hit him for another touchdown. Carlos was the guy that uh, had a huge day that day. He caught he caught another touchdown pass on a screen pass, so he had a big, big day. I think once we got the momentum back and got them on the run, so to speak, they, they were playing not to lose, rather than being aggressive. You can talk all you want about the offense and, and all the plays we made. We don't win that without the defense. It stops in the second half. I felt like we wore them down uh, towards the end of the game, and I think especially offensively, as physical as their defense was, they didn't, they didn't have quite that physicality uh, late in the game, especially with their D-line the D getting pressure on me. Their posture changed, you know, the crowd, the noise of the crowd changed. Um, and they got booed late in the game, which is a shame. That, that hurts. But, uh, you know, I guess when there's a 31-0 score, the fans kind of expect you to win that game. Well, I think uh, the main adjustment we made is, 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 to, is to play a lot better on defense, which we did, and only give up one touchdown in the second half. And Chris, I think we scored, we had the ball six times in the second half and scored, scored on four of those occasions. At this point in the fourth quarter, we were in a rhythm. Like, if we scored 20-some points in the fourth quarter. We were really unstoppable throwing it and running it. The offensive line was doing everything right. Everybody was putting it. And it was just such an opposite of where we were in the first half. One of the biggest drives of the game, I think it got us within one score, if I recall. We got the ball down inside the 10. We threw like a little uh, waggle pass. And it hit Jim Palmer in the, in the end zone. And I got rid of it really quick. Like I made a fake, turned around, he was there, I threw it. And immediately a flag came flying in for holding. But it's third goal for the 20. And we got to throw, you know, a deep crossing route to Jeff Graham. And they pretty much know what's coming because we got no other options, right? And they came after us. And it was one of the most beautiful plays I've been a part of because everybody did their job. I had to sit in the pocket and wait. Our backs picked up a blitz. The old line did an amazing job. Jeff ran into coverage. I put it on him right when I got hit. I just, he caught it about the three and stretched it to the one. That was huge because, again, it was a must. We couldn't kick a field goal. We needed six. So uh, then on fourth down, we ran the option, and I, you know, I snuck it in and, uh, again, went for two. So it was just one of those. It was no matter what they were throwing at us, we were, we were, we were making it happen. We got the ball back with two or three minutes left to go in the game. We had to go score, you know, to, to win the game. Greg Proud made a great decision. He hit Carlos Snow coming out of the backfield for a pretty good game. But then that's when he hit Palmer for 23 yards. It was second 23, and he hit, hit him for 20. I think a 23 yard gain, or maybe maybe a little more than that for first down. But I was so much in the moment that I knew what the next play was going to be. I knew that what the result was going to be. When the play came in the huddle, I just smiled. Because it was, it was exactly what I knew was coming. Get Jeff one-on-one -on -one versus the safety, which is a major mismatch. I was supposed to make a play fake to Carlos, and I didn't even do it, because I was like, I, it, it didn't matter. And Jeff beat the safety badly, and it was really an easy throw. And the irony is that that might have been the easiest throw of the game, the winning touchdown pass. What I do remember after that play is I took my helmet off, which I had never done. And I just think it was a an act of, wow, we just did this, like, you know, and I, I wanted to take it in because I knew the significance of what we did. When that happened, we, it was the second greatest comeback in college football history. And at the, end, at the end of the day, you know, we did pull it off, and that's one that's going to stand forever in the record books, and, and that's, uh, that's a pretty cool thing to be a part of. <laughs> the old saying, it's not over, but it's over. And when you got skilled athletes like we had there threw the ball as well as we did in the second half you got a chance against against anybody you play 
and we try to stay positive. Coach them up. What you see is what you coach. The team plays poorly, you probably do a poorly job of coaching. If you can play good, deep, solid defense and score like we did in the second half, score like four out of six times to get the ball in the second half, you're going to be a hard team. I think that this game will probably continue to stand the test of time as being the greatest comeback in the history of Ohio State football. I don't see there ever being a team that gets 30 plus points behind and working their way back up. As, uh, as Greg Fry told me, there's just a certain point where there's just not enough time to work your way back. And because of this game, players like Greg Fry, Carlos Snow, Jeff Graham, and everyone else that was on that team will be remembered for all time by Buckeye Nation because they did something that will never be done again. My name's Christian. I was born a Buckeye. And until next time, OH. Thank you for checking out Born a Buckeye. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, I'd ask if it's possible, maybe you could take a moment to check out our Patreon and see if you might join us in helping us to continue producing more episodes of Born a Buckeye and all the other interesting documentaries that we make here at CM Films. I'd like to thank uh, Greg Fry and Coach John Cooper for taking the time to speak with me about this story. I think it's one of the great stories in the history of Ohio State. Mr. Fry asked me to mention Canine Companions for Independence, which is a very cool charity that trains uh, guide dogs uh, for people that need help getting around. So if you have a moment, check out Canine Companions for Independence and maybe consider giving them a donation as well. I'd also like to thank Coach John Johnson for putting me together. Uh, with Mr. Fry and Coach Cooper, and thank you very much for watching this episode. Go Bucks!